this, we might as well start here. This is our outlet store. Um, what we do here is we have it open Thursday through Sunday. We usually open from 11 to 5. And uh, as you see, a lot of the goods are heavily discounted. And this is not anything that you will actually find in our flagship store. These are overruns from previous productions. Because our flagship store is so closely located to our outlet, we want to make sure that our full price customer gets the full price experience. And uh, what we have here is basically, you know, liquidating the goods instead of selling them to some other outlet um, or to some other discounter. We might as well um, do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we have a huge following. Uh, we have been at this location since 95. The previous outlet store was facing 10th Street, but now we have moved it towards um, our warehouse. And people just love a good deal and they like to rummage. So this is a perfect opportunity and we have a local uh, following here. I can show you a little bit around, you know, um, our flagship store obviously looks very different. Um, this is the outlet store. And uh, quite often, you know, you have the opportunity to get full size runs. Um, across multiple styles, but uh, what you see is what you get. Come on in, I'm going to show you the office. Uh, at our 20th anniversary, the city of Berkeley um, gave us a proclamation, the mayor came wow. since we have been here since uh, 95 and it was really an amazing honor to have a representative of the city of Berkeley um, give us the proclamation and the same year I also won uh, a congressional honor for the work that we do and inspiring youth wow I don't have it displayed anywhere just because I'm really humble but it was <laughs> really given to me by Barbara Lee which was really incredible yeah. so That's awesome. anyway what's going on here is just a quick introduction this is current product that's in the store it's yeah, fall 18 it. and it just gives you an idea how uh, the product gets merchandise and put together clearly there is so much uh, depth and it can be worn in multiple ways this, for example, is a wool cotton. It's wool on the outside, cotton on the inside, and I'm playing with the asymmetrical style lines, which I'm known for. Women absolutely love that the garments are understandable, but there's a lot of depth that goes into that. Um, super comfy. This is one of our main fabrications. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing it right now. It is uh, a cotton based infused with a 6% steel fiber. It makes it perfect for traveling because part of the look is the wrinkle effect and it is also water repellent and it's super comfy. Um, another one of our um, best selling fabrications of course is our cotton poplin shirts. This is like a modern tape with a little zipper and our ponty, we have lots of ponty styles. I also do a lot with fully fashion knit. These are sweater garments. Um, and this is another one of our top um, yarns. It's a tinsel cotton blend. And as you can see, a lot of what we do is either very natural or very um, environmentally friendly. So that's our edge. But at the end of the day, what matters to me is to create beautiful styles. They are classic with a twist. There's a lot of architectural details. I mean, women that have an understanding about construction really appreciate all of this. And um, what matters is that it's understandable. What matters that is that a lot of different body shapes look beautiful in it. And um, I appeal to a wide range of ages. Mm -hmm. And it has longevity. It's not just burn and churn. This is something that you will have in your closet for a long time. So let's continue. Yara, who is our vice president of um, our e-commerce, this is her office. She is out and about. Ernesto comes around the corner, which is our uh, shipping manager. You'll see him later on in the warehouse. What's happening here? All right, so here is where I work primarily when I come up with new um, seasons, new designs. As you can see, I have piles and piles of printouts. So this is the work that I do. I pretty much, you know, follow what's going on in the world of fashion, whether it's New York, whether it's Rio de Janeiro, it's London, it's Paris. It's important for me to know what are the trends that are coming up. 
And um, the other thing that also is important, do those trends apply to my customer? Because a lot of what might be really happening out there in the fashion world, my customer might say, well, it's great, but it's not going to look good on me. For example, when hip huggers were so happening, well, my customer is not going to wear hip huggers because she's got hips and she's not interested in displaying them. So we need to really work with disguising the trends. I usually interpret what's going on out there and make it very user-friendly for my customer. I interpret trends in such a way that my customer will understand it. I work also with forecasting services that allow me to actually gather information. What's going on here, I subscribe to color forecasting services. They pretty much predict what's going on, you know, about a year from now. Here is a box that will apply for spring 19. Um, it looks like too many colors in this box, but I have an understanding how I can utilize these colors and make a cohesive group out of them so it all looks really beautiful. <coughs> um, I have multiple yarns that I'm working with. Um, I um, have um, prints that I will be considering, for example, and uh, we touched upon that a little bit yesterday when I gave a slight introduction. Prints are trademarked. They're copyrighted. You have to be very, very careful how you use them. There are companies out there primarily either out of New York or Europe that have representatives that come to the United States and they sell original prints and how you uh, for example this is a company called iDazzler we work with they will um, show you what the print will look like on fabric and then they also supply a digital CD that you can figure out the repeat and if you want to do the recoloration shrink down the um, size of the print but um, why I'm showing this to you is we, when we buy a print and they're usually anywhere from 500 to 600 dollars we buy the rights so this is a copyrighted print that belongs to us now. We bought it from iDazzler and we can do whatever we want with this print. Mm -hmm. uh, here you kind of see uh, another inspiration that I had. Instead of just buying prints that are available out there in the market that I can own, I designed my own. I was really inspired by like a skeleton leaf yeah. and because I use a lot of natural fibers for spring, I use linens and I use hemp. Mm -hmm. Um, I figured, you know, that kind of ties in beautifully with having a skeleton leaf, which is a very natural element, printed on a linen or a on a hemp. And I can show you later on how I interpreted that on the fabric. And here I'm just playing with a lot of concepts. This is, for example, called a dirty wash. It's not the most flattering uh, name, but it gives it a very casual look. This is one of our styles that has done six incredibly well, but this is a new fabrication where this dirty wash looks really good on. Again, this is my tencel cotton, interpreted in a beautiful wrap. Uh, here I'm playing with a tie-dye technique on a jersey. Um, again, you can see, you know, the style is very architectural. This was an amazing print for us a couple of years ago. And again, you know, it starts out, I'm getting inspired by a print that I've actually resourced. And then I'm contacting one of my print suppliers and I basically say to them, can you create an original for me? And this is something that we have been working on right now in order to create something like this, which mm -hmm. will belong to us. Up here, I have um, tons of samples that I draw inspiration from. It's either fabrication, it's either style details, it's either the style itself. Here, it looks like a big mess, but believe it or not, it's very organized. I have lots of different fabrics that I'm um, considering. Obviously, we've done a lot of sourcing, a lot of knits uh, to be um, used as inspiration. More samples over here, more samples over here. Alan who does a lot of the uh, creatives for us, sits in this office. He's out and about right now, but as you can see, his walls are plastered with styles and ideas and how it's all gonna come together. Oh, and Alan is also a fine artist, he paints. Steve, yes. our CEO, is sitting right here. Um, more, I oh, colors. Over the years, I've collected not only um, do I subscribe to color services, I work with Pantone, Pantone is probably uh, the leading company as far as colors are concerned. And what's beautiful about Pantone, and I'm just going to take one of the books down, these are standard colors. Um, and this is what allows you to work on an international basis. 
So when I select any of the colors in the Pantone books, and these are very expensive books, they cost thousands of dollars, right? For example, I'm going to pick a little bit of a more pleasant color here. These are the basics. Let's say I'm interested in using an orange just because we just had Halloween and we're going to Thanksgiving. What I can communicate to my uh, factory overseas, no matter whether they do knits, wovens, I will tell them this is the color standard I would mm. like to use. It's Pantone code 181450TC and they will know that they need to match my fabrication with this color. Okay. And that's really how it, it works. It's wonderful or I can submit a color standard, but usually working with Pantone makes it so much easier. It doesn't really matter whether you produce in Peru, in China, in Vietnam, in the United States. I mean, we still do a lot of garment dyeing in LA, and this is a great way of communicating to any of the people that deal with colors. All right, let's move on. Um, Oh, this is an organic cotton French terry, and what I have done here is I combined it again with our main fabric. It's a really awesome style. Yeah, I like this. It has three fabrications. It has a fully fashioned knit um, strip, and it has um, the metal cotton sateen and 100% organic French terry. I'll show you a lot more styles as we go. Here's another beautiful item where we have the mesh printed in combination with fully fashioned knit trim and a jersey. So there's so much here that I'm going to show you guys. All right, are we ready to move on? This is a quick tour that I'm giving you. <laughs> All right, so what's going on here? Um, as you can see, there's tons of binders on both sides. And these are pretty much the fabrications and the seasons that we're dealing with. Everything has a coat, our hemp tensile, hemp, hemp nylon jersey, uh, French metal, sweaters, and so on. And this is usually what we work with. And these binders are huge. You have to stay very organized when you're coordinating hundreds of styles every year. You can see that we have the production sheets in here, right? For example, this shows our factory. These are all the sweaters we are going to be producing in this particular yarn. For example, items that were dropped and items that will continue. Then here are all the trims we'll be using on the various colors. Here are the buttons we'll be using. Um, here are all the lab dips. For example, we decided on our colors, right? And these are our approved colors for the season. And how we go about it, we have a Pantone. Here's Pantone again, the color box. And the factory overseas knows the exact bulbs that need to be used so we can actually look at color under the same light. Because oh, really you guys probably know that light makes a big difference how a color is perceived. And when you work with um, approving colors for the various fabrications within a collection, your t-shirt has to match your woven, has to match your sweater, has to match all of this. It's important that when you uh, deal with people overseas on the other side of the planet to have a system set up, and in this case it's the Pantone color um, viewing light box, to look under it under the same light. Because if they have a rainy day or a cloudy day and it's sunny over here, mm -hmm. we'll be communicating and not hit the spot. That's brilliant. So yeah. this is uh, what we do here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit into detail. You might be wondering, what on earth is all this stuff right here, right? When you buy fabric, it's really important to make sure that whatever you buy is really what's being submitted. For example, with our fabrication, we'll always make sure that we say our jersey. Our jersey has to be 180 grams per square meter. Mm -hmm. And what this device does, it has a blade, and when you get your fabric submitted, you will actually uh, create a little circle and then you will put it on a scale that is specifically designed for weighing fabric. Hey Pauline, um, and then you will know if the factory is trying to n not necessarily um, on purpose uh, sell you goods that are not 180 grams a square meter because weight matters. If it's only 160, you will say to them, this is not what I'm paying for, you need to see to it that you give me the weight that I want. Quality is so important and I think the one thing that we have done incredibly well over the years, 
it's clearly um, a very complex business. It requires a lot of detail to attention, but to the, at the end of the day, what the customer expects, it's consistency and it's quality, and I think we have done a great job over the years to deliver just that. Mm -hmm. But as you can see on the background, there is so much that goes into that, right? Um, okay, again, um, I'm not going to go super in depth. I feel like I already went a little bit too deep into what I'm trying to explain here. Um, I'm going to put this back. Jimmy just entered our sample room. And what happens in our sample room right here, again, these are in the boxes, is my fabric library that I've collected over the years, right? I'm not going to bore you nor show you too much, but they're pretty much labeled and to me it makes a lot of sense. Like if I'm looking for a 100% cotton shirt weight, this is the box that I'm going to dig through. These are the vendors that I will be contacting because they have the fabrication that I'm interested in. Um, so, and as you can see, there is a whole wall over here and there's another wall over there and I have trims and buttons and laces and knits. Um, all of this makes sense to me. I know exactly where I need to dig, you know, in order to find what I want for the next season. And this has been collected over the years by going to sourcing shows, going to fabric shows, and uh, really establishing relationships. What you see here is our spring 19 that we are really aiming to produce. Clearly not the whole um, uh, selection, we will narrow it down, but these are all the styles that already have been created and the various colors. And this right here gives you a little bit uh, more of an indication of how it looks. Here you see the garments on the racks and you're like, it looks like a hodgepodge of stuff, but at the end of the day how it's being displayed, and these are not editorial shots, these are product shots, it just gives you an idea what the collection will end up looking like. Um, this is the this one is from side, spring, right? yeah, uh, and this is the 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 other side. Mm -hmm. So it's merchandise, right? Nice. Um, what we do here also is um, not all the photo shoots are done here. This is when we need quick shots. Mm -hmm. We usually work with a photographer, and when we schedule Amy, our model, uh, they fly up from Los Angeles, and uh, we create a studio in house not here, out there in the warehouse, and then we also go around town and do editorial shots uh, in beautiful locations. Okay, let's move on. Pauline, I want you to meet Jimmy. Hi. Hi Jimmy, this is Pauline. <laughs> Teo, this is Pauline. Hi. Pauline has pretty much been one of our first employees ever. Uh, when we did a lot of production domestically, before we took our production overseas, Pauline ran it. She was our domestic production manager. Um, Pauline works with me um, on the technical execution of the garments, and on the weekends she tends to the sales of the uh, warehouse. Uh, okay, so what's going on here? Pauline, do you mind firing up the computer really quickly? Sure. Yeah. Um, I I development, product development happens right here. Um, it all starts with an idea, and quite often um, the idea starts with a quick sketch based on the fabrics that I sourced, based on the uh, sourcing that I did as far as what are the next trends. We do some quick sketches. Who does the sketches? Um, I do. Oh, cool. Just really quickly. Like, yeah. is this really what I want to do? How is it all going to come together? When it becomes more of a style, before the style is actually being created, Clearly the sketches are executed in a, in a more um, graphic way, more beautiful way. We know that something is going to be becoming a style. And then what happens is um, we're putting the work through um, pattern development. I do all the patterns in-house. I like to keep them in-house. I tried doing patterns overseas. I'm a little bit of a stickler for details and I like the consistency. So this is the kind of tech work I will not give up. Pattern work usually is being done on the computer. Pauline, do you mind just pulling any style up sure. on the computer? Um, it's a combination of doing some hand work, but primarily computer work. And um, this is, for example, a style, it's a jersey style. This is what the pattern looks like. Once the pattern is finalized, and I usually go through the process three times. First pattern. 
Pauline is also sewing the first samples, and I'm going to show you the machines outside. We do a fitting. We correct the fit if there's something going on. We're going to do a second pattern. By the third time, we should have the fit down. When, once the fit is down, it gets digitized on this big table before the final pattern gets entered into the system. And uh, you're firing up the computer right now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what you will see here is all the various pattern pieces will show up on the computer just like that. This happens to be, oh, that's the, 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 the back mm -hmm. of the tuber tunic. Yeah. I uh, know, I know my pattern pieces. <laughs> um, and um, so you can actually do a lot of the, uh, the pattern work, the corrections, the grading, the whatnot in the system. And before um, we send the patterns out to our factory, it's usually a DFX file. So they get the pattern sent to them via the computer system. Uh, we make sure that all our specifications are right, that all our patterns are uh, correct in terms of sizing and grading. And we double check all of this. Why don't you come into the pattern library with me? As you can see, I have a big plotter over here. We print out all the patterns that we create on the plotter, and then we do manual checking. And how it comes off the plotter is um, on a big roll. These are patterns that need to be checked. We need to make sure that all the pieces are on here, that all the uh, notches are in here, the grain lines are in here. So it, it takes a lot of checking. But I know whatever I send to my factory overseas that A, it's perfect. All they need to do is take my pattern, take the first sample that we create, duplicate it, send a first uh, um, pre-production sample back to me so I can see that everything was understood from the trims to the colors to the stitches per inch to the buttons to make sure that it fits and what you see in here obviously we have created a lot of sweaters and I have them all organized according to style number these are the styles some of the styles that were created in the past three four years I have them organized according to uh, tops jackets skirts pants dresses and with every style that's hanging here, there's a pattern attached to it and a specification card. And I usually, as a designer, people always think, this must be such a creative job. I crunch a lot of numbers. I work with numbers all the time. You guys do it on a different level. I do it when it comes to um, making sure that the garments actually will fit properly. So this is what you see here. So every style has a pattern attached and um, Let's move on. Swingle, did you need something from me? No. No. All right. Um, then we come full circle over here. Um, Molly, our controller, is not in today, but you met her yesterday. Um, this is customer service, and uh, Emily and Alan are working on a bunch of creatives right now. Um, and as you can see, they are working on what's going to be released for November, what is going to be released for December, and what is going to be released for January. And they're in the stages of, um, maybe you want to talk to that, Emily, since uh, this is your thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're planning for um, Black Friday and Cyber Monday which involves a lot of multiple touch points for the customer and it's we have to do social media email website um so it's a lot of planning that goes involved is involved in this al how about you same i agree <laughs> <laughs> just getting all the the images together and, and doing getting the, the flow thing. yeah yeah okay moving on <laughs> i'm gonna um we're going to go through the outlet right now, and I'm going to show you the machine part. Conference room, we're going to end up here. <laughs> and uh, so let's walk you through here. This is going to be quick. We're not going to have to spend too much time. So, this is the warehouse. <laughs> This is the warehouse. There's really not much to explain, right? Um, what you see on the shelves, and they go all the way towards the back, it's our current inventory that we are carrying, stuff that is available for immediate sale. Um, just to um, come over here, 
when the goods arrive from overseas, they have gone through multiple quality control checks. Um, and we trust our contacts and our people that we work with that everything has been executed because a lot of steps have been implemented before the goods arrive to make sure that it is perfect. But regardless, we still do spot checks. We measure the goods, we really inspect them. If we find any discrepancies, we start with a 5% quality control check. Eventually we will do 10%, 50%, and 100% if there is anything that fell through the cracks because at the end of the day, what matters to us is that our customer receives first quality goods and they don't know the hoops we jump through in order to make it happen. So, but more often than not, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, everything here is clearly organized according to style number, color, style name, and sizes. And Ernesto, who is somewhere right now, he's probably in the back somewhere, knows how to pull it all together and we ship out of this location. This is also our distribution center. Clearly, you see a bunch of boxes here. <laughs> um, and, uh, what you see right here, this used to be all our warehouse. We had about 22,000 square feet. We um, subleased it to the Berkeley Ballet Company. Reason being, we don't do domestic production anymore. We don't need all that space. But what we have kept is our sample room. And um, you see a whole lineup of machines, right? And every machine does a particular function. This, for example, is a keyhole buttonhole machine. This one is a machine that attaches buttons. I'm not going to bore you too much. Um, this is a, another machine that um, does a different kind of buttonhole. Um, this is a single needle stitch machine. Um, this is an overlock machine. This is a machine that sews jersey. So without going really into detail, oh, this is a machine that attaches elastics. This is a blind hem. So we keep a sample room intact, and it's kind of quiet here today, um, because what matters to me is I want to make sure that I test my patterns and that I have all the equipment that I need to really make sure that what I produce will fit properly. And when I send the goods off to my factories overseas, again, you know, I'm going to be repetitive here, they get a perfect pattern and they get a perfect sample to follow, which makes it so much easier. Instead of communicating back and forth, you didn't do this right and you didn't do that right. It's like, here's the pattern, use it. Here's what it needs to look like, you know, with all the details, make that happen. But in addition, I also give them a spec sheet, a spec package, a development package per style with all the details in written form as well. So um, that is pretty much it in a nutshell. And then when we go over to the flagship store, where the eye candy really is, there you will see how the product is being presented and it's just really beautiful. Here it's a production site. This is where the magic ultimately happens and then at the store it's being presented to the public. And we do the same thing with online when we show the product the way it really deserves to be shown. And um, well, last thing, this is where I sit. Again, I have tons of styles in here and my daughter comes to work after school, so I have a little <laughs> setup for her. Um, and yeah, so I'm working you know, with all the styles that are currently on the wall in order to figure out how we're going to string it all together. Uh, my little one likes to sew. I wonder where she got that from. Um, <laughs> that's it. And I sit at my computer. <laughs> <coughs> so I know the viewers have a few questions, Stella, okay. such as, uh, how long have you been doing this for? 25 years. And it's really interesting because um, my mother was in the industry. My mother was a sample seamstress and she did not want me to go into this business. And being first generation immigrant, I was born and raised in Germany, but my parents are Greek. Um, I had to go to college. And since I wasn't allowed to pursue design, it's the typical mindset, especially back then, you know, our kids are gonna get a college education and they're gonna be the first generation that will make a difference. Um, since I was raised bilingual, I grew up, you know, speaking languages, I became a translator, knowing really well that I'm not going to be working in that field. At the time, I had a friend who was going to grad school at UC Berkeley, 
and she said to me, why don't you come out here? I think you're going to like it. So when I came out, I loved it. I fell in love with California. I fell in love with Berkeley. And I went back to design school, much to the dismay of my parents. But um, when I graduated, you know, I went straight into this business. And shortly thereafter, I met Stephen and Alan, who became my business partners. And we have been doing this ever since. Mind you, we have gone through a lot of ups and downs and uh, multiple reiterations of the company, but this is where we are right now, and it's still very exciting. What are some struggles and challenges that you've experienced in running a business like this? Um, and is it production? Is it um, employees? Is it... What are some of those obstacles that you, you know, have to go through? I would say it's a little bit of everything. Uh, when we first started out, um, we didn't really take a vacation for seven years. We worked literally seven days a week. Um, it was pretty hard to get the company off the ground. Um, but then, you know, it started gaining momentum and then we started expanding. We were selling wholesale across the U.S. We ended up um, adding distributorships in Australia and in Canada. And uh, money is always an issue, especially when you're self-funded and trying to find money. Um, and, you know, simply the ups and downs. I mean, every election year, what we have noticed over the past 25 years, you know, sales dip. And now with direct-to-consumer, uh, I don't have to tell you what really happened in our industry. Even big companies went under. And it's a matter of really trying to adjust and to be really aware of what's going on out there in the market and really remain flexible and try to go with the flow to keep reinventing yourself. I think that's the most important thing. Just when you think you got it, you got to pay attention to what's happening because you can lose it just like that. And I think this industry in particular, what most people don't realize, there are so many components, so many loose pieces that are constantly in motion. It really takes somebody to have an understanding and a bird's eye view how to string it all together because at the end of the day what matters to the customer, they want their, good when their goods when they are promised to receive them and they want first quality. It doesn't really matter the hoops that you have to jump through to get to that point. And they shouldn't have to worry about that. That's why you're in business. But it's a complex business and it's beyond being creative. It really is about having a sense of running a business. I think. A lot of designers, you know, they think they're going to be sitting on a golden throne waving that wand and things happen. As a designer, you really have to also have an understanding about technical execution and really have a business mind. At the end of the day, this isn't really fine art. It's a commercial product you're putting out there. And if nobody wants it, you can be as creative as you want to be. It doesn't matter. And the other thing also that's important, understand your customer. Know, know who your customer is. You're not going to be everything to everybody. And it really takes time to hone into that and to really be willing to let also the business dictate where the customer is. You might start out with an idea of who you want your customer to be, but your product will eventually lead you to the customer. And you need to be able to adjust and really be fine-tuning into that and then create a product and deliver a product for that particular customer. And keep in mind, even that customer, you know, evolves to stay in touch with what's happening, even with your customer. So it's an ongoing process with a lot of loose components. But if you thrive on the complexity, it keeps you up at night, but it also charges you at the same time. This is the business to be in. <laughs> now, another question is, for those who are looking to start their fashion business, mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them? And um, in, in, from when you started, uh, what were some of those struggles and things like that? I think the most important thing is follow your dream and really trust your inner voice and what you're capable of producing. I have had a lot of naysayers in my life and my personality is such when somebody tells me that I cannot do it, I immediately switch into watch me. Um, and that's not necessarily valid for everybody, but that has really been a driving force for me. Um, be aware that it is a cash intensive business. You can certainly start small. Everybody needs to start small, but um, be aware that it's not just about being creative. You really also have to embrace business savvy and an understanding how business operates. 
I have seen a lot of designers, you know, not being interested in the business aspect. And that's fine. As long as you actually align yourself with a partner that can do that aspect, then you have probably a very good marriage. But really, it is not about creativity. And the other important piece is don't design for yourself. You design for a market. And your voice will matter up to a degree because you will spin it into something that brings your voice forward. But at the end of the day, you are designing for a customer. And also, don't be afraid to really stretch your own limits, your own creative limits, um, your customer's limits. You know, they need to be challenged at times. Um, but what matters is to know where your money makers always have the availability for them and then you can add the crazy creative aspects as well, which makes it interesting. Quite often they are the lost leaders. They will get the customer interested, but then at the end they're going to buy the basic because that's what they use and what they're most interested in. So. Now another question is, uh, this is probably a question that everyone's dying to know. <laughs> so um, you have a, a amazing line of product here. I do. Um, it's just incredible what you've put up. Uh, just within how many years you said 25 years yeah. that's amazing so um, a lot of viewers that have boutiques and and you know they have all these um, stores and they're selling product already how can they get in touch with you and do you do any licensing do you do wholesaling and what what's the uh, what's a good contact for your company you know it's interesting we haven't really done any licensing yet um, might be on the horizon we haven't really pursued that we have wholesaled, that was our main business, um, for about 24 years. 2018 is the first year that we did not wholesale. We uh, got out of wholesale for multiple reasons, and um, the biggest one was paying attention to the disruptors out in the market. What is that new wave of garment brands, garment manufacturers doing? And they're going direct to consumer. Clearly, e-commerce is becoming bigger and bigger on a daily basis. And I think if you want to survive as a brand, you need to really figure out the e-commerce piece. Now, are we completely opposed to going back into wholesale? Um, that's on the table for discussion. Um, but I also believe that the wholesale model, the way it has been in the past 50 years, believe it or not, the industry hasn't changed is a little bit outdated. Um, you have to deliver product much sooner than what the season ultimately is all about. For example, you have to deliver fall product in summertime. And by the time fall rolls around, everything is on sale. Um, the um, insatiable appetite that's out there in the market, it can never be fast enough. It can never be cheap enough. It can never be vast enough. And it's a little bit of a rat race. And um, it kind of has always bothered me because I also tend to have more of a sustainable ecological mindset. What I would like to do now is focus on direct to consumer, keep up the amazing quality that we have been producing all along, but be more mindful what we produce, how we produce, the how has always been pretty much aligned with sustainability, but I want to expand in those areas and really offer smaller capsules that can be um, digested and understood and make it a lot more appealing to the consumer and buy it as a whole instead of bombarding her with hundreds of styles because even that gets a little bit confusing. If you create tiny little uh, visual sound bites or visual bites, if you will, beautifully merchandise. It has a lot more value instead of offering a bunch of stuff out there and see what sticks. And I think at this point we have enough history to know where we need to go and how we need to position ourselves to actually bring that into the foreground. And there's a lot of discussions going on in the background how we might really bring that eco mindset, sustainability mindset, producing less but produce better, also into wholesale again at some point but for now we are focusing on direct to consumer because the beauty of direct to consumer i don't have to tell you guys this you can continue producing a top quality product and offer a lower price point 
which ultimately allows you to almost compete with fast fashion, except what we are producing is not fast fashion. Because you cut out the middleman, you don't have showroom expenses, you don't have uh, trade, sh trade shows expenses, you don't have uh, the middleman, which are the sales reps, um, the, there is no markup from the actual retailer that eventually has to put the markup on. You can go direct to consumer and offer them top product at a reasonable price. So that's also the advantage to be able to do that. Awesome. And what is your big passion? What, what wakes you up in the morning? Um, I love designing. I, I, I've actually known that I wanted to do this since I was a kid. Um, I absolutely love, love, love working with real women. I know that in fashion you have to have the glorification of a beautiful woman showing the goods, which we do. We have Amy, she's fabulous. We have worked with her for a long time. But really, at the end of the day, what matters to me is I want to make the everyday woman look beautiful. I want to give her a product that she absolutely loves, can wear from morning to evening, that it's easy care, you don't have to dry clean most of the stuff that I produce. And I'm very body conscious. Over the years, I've really learned and I've heard it all. Uh, my muffin top, my hips, my big arms, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too this, I'm too that. and. I'm taking that into account when I produce clothing. Um, I say not everything is for everybody, but I will make sure that there is enough variety where I know that certain body types will look absolutely gorgeous wearing certain styles. And I think that is really what differentiates me. The other piece that is really dear to my heart is sustainability and eco-friendliness uh, for most people out there. And we really don't lead with that. We were the first company in, to, in the United States to actually launch a collection made out of hemp. Oh my God, in 1993, it was so revolutionary to be able to do this. And the hemp industry has gained a huge momentum 25 years later. I mean, you guys know what's going on out there on the market with hemp. It has entered mainstream. Uh, it's great to know that we were one of the first uh, people out there that actually were in touch with all the radicals that really made a push politically and environmentally and socially and you name it. Um, sustainability matters to me big time and uh, not only body inclusivity but size inclusivity. A lot of the cool designer brands out there based on my research, they will offer items from a size 0 to 12. Occasionally they will offer a size 14 and they completely disregard the fact that the average American woman these days is a size 16. So now this woman is being told you need to go shop at plus size. Plus size is not bad, but it still comes with a little bit of body shaming. And if we're really all about empowering women and actually sending them a different message, embrace who you are, embrace your, your natural beauty, you know, no, you're not going to be six feet and have perfect body dimensions and weigh two pounds in order to look like a clothes hanger. Really embrace who you are. And this is really what I'm interested in. You know, I want to make sure that the everyday woman finds something that is not too matronly looking, but she also doesn't fit in her daughter's clothes to give her something that looks beautiful on her, is contemporary, happens to be environmentally friendly, which is not what I lead with. It's the backstory. And I offer sizes up to 18. A little itty bitty petite size two can look equally beautiful as a size 18. And I'm going to also lean into size 20 coming up soon because having um, an inclusive uh, range of body uh, images and sizes matters to me and a lot of designers don't do that because it also comes with some technical difficulties. Um, once you grade up to a certain size, your patterns change slightly, but since I'm a little bit of a nerd, I love pattern making and I love specs, I have no problem, you know, doing that. So I actually enjoy that. So to wrap it up, environmentally friendly, being sustainable, body and size inclusivity, that's really what I'm about. And offering a product that is really contemporary and can be worn from morning to evening and it's easy care. It's a lot, it's a mouthful, but it's all of it. And that's what really uh, ma matters to me. That's what makes me thrive. That's what I love. I'm passionate about. And I have a lot of women that love us because of it. Women that have discovered us follow us for that very reason. Well, there you go, guys. <laughs> that's Stella. And uh, that's how you really build a fashion 
business yeah. uh, over 25 yeah. years of doing this that's amazing well thank you so much Stella thank you very much